Welcome back to the Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel. In this video, we are going to do the second of three videos on carving some bone fish hooks. Now, the first fish hook that we carved is this little guy, and this is a natural form fish hook carved in one piece from the uh, large pasture and bone of a cow, and the bend of the hook follows the natural bend in the bone. And this is a very nice way to make a bone fish hook, but Bone is brittle and has a relatively low tensile strength. So anytime you're making a one piece fish hook, you have to have the bend of the hook here outlandishly thick in order to be durable enough to resist the pull of a large fish. But there's a second way to do that and that is what we're going to do in this video. That is to make a two piece fish hook where the barb, the, the point and the barb are one piece, the shank is a second piece, and they're lashed together with a strong thread of some sort. So this replaces the low tensile strength of bone with the high tensile strength of a well-made cord, and it gives you a stronger fish hook overall. So this is the actual hook we carve in this video, so you can follow along with this actual hook step by step. And the only thing that's different about this view here is in the video, I do the lashing with this ghastly thick uh, jute cord. And that's so that you can actually see what I'm doing as I tie the knots, but it makes a real lumpy thick lashing. So I retied it with this nice 100% linen archival book binders thread. Um, and it makes a nice, a, a much nicer finished piece using the finer cord. But the lashing, that you see here is done exactly the same way as what I demonstrate in the video with the thicker material. So I just want to mention that at the onset. Now, this is going to have a special purpose. I'm going to send this off to another YouTuber, Mr. Rich Lamont, who ties full dress salmon flies. And for anybody who's not familiar with what a full dress salmon fly is, this is one that I did uh, over a decade ago, 2007, I have it marked. And this is, actually I made that hook too, although obviously of a much different material. <laughs> so if you're interested in metal fish hooks, you know, leave me a comment and uh, maybe we could do a video on that somewhere along the line. But this is just an example of a fancy salmon fly that I had handy to show you where we're going with this. He's not going to tie that exact fly. I, th I think he's going to design one just for this hook. But when his video is out, I'll put a link in the description so that you can see what it ends up becoming. So I hope that you will enjoy following us along as we make this little beautiful hook and stay tuned to the third in the series where we are going to make a deliberately fancy ornate one piece hook. So I'll see you in, at the beginning of the project. So we have just completed our bone hook from natural forms, and when you do a natural form, it's a natural form. That's the shape it is. Now I did use the, a bit more material in the bend than I did at the edges. I left a little extra there. You always have to do that. And as a little bit of a side note, this is all the dust that came off it. Save that. That's not trash. That's fertilizer. Very good garden fertilizer. Now. The uh, other option is to carve a bone out of one piece and design it. Okay? When you're doing that, you have to be even more careful to make sure that you leave extra material in the bend region of your hook because you basically have the equivalent of cross grain. Now remember, the grain and bone spirals so it's not perfect cross grain the way it would be in a similarly cut wood piece, but it still is cross grain. So if you look at North, uh, North American one piece hooks, you often have pieces that are cut with huge exaggerated, you have to forgive me, I'm drawing sideways for you, okay huge exaggerated bits of material back here in the bend of the hook. OK? 
Okay. These are common archaeologically. Well, as common as bone ever is. Bone is not the most durable of materials, at least compared to stone and things like that. But this right there, that big blob, is to compensate for the fact that you have functionally something approximating cross grain in that region. And that's where the majority of the strain is. So you need to have lots of material there. You see the same thing in your classic Polynesian circle hook. Okay. You have something like this. And now if we have the, th the shank this thickness, when we get to the back, we're going to leave just like before, lots of extra material back here. So you'll always see these. The back has more material than the front, and usually these have a barb on them, and it's usually toward the outside, so we're not occluding that middle. Okay. So again, there's our strength, that extra material in the bend of the hook. Now to make one of these, if you want to make a hook in a larger size, you need a BHB, stands for a big honkin' bone, right? So if you have a big honkin' bone with lots of nice flat surfaces here, you can just design whatever hook you want and the bone will accommodate it. Okay? But what if you don't have a big honkin' bone, or at least not a big honkin' bone that's honkin' enough to make the particular big honkin' hook you want? Well, then we make a composite hook. And there's a couple forms of these. One is, we'll go back to Polynesia, we have big shark hooks. And this is going to be somewhat small, even though I'm drawing a big hook, where we have a piece of wood cut out something like this. And this would be a natural branch. Again, forgive my art, I'm drawing sideways for you. Usually these taper to a straight point and they just have a straight snood there. And now here we will cut out a piece of bone to match that. Okay, with the darkened area being bone and this being lashed in. And now as long as this big piece is cut from a natural crook, the grain will go along the bend and you won't have that cross grain problem. You can never make something like this out of a board. If you have cross grain there, it will break 10 out of 10 times. Okay. So you have to have a large branch in a fairly exaggerated crook like that out of a very dense wood. Now, Polynesia is blessed with some very dense woods that you can do this out of and make nice strong hooks. In Alaska, you have the, the halibut hooks, okay, where we have something like this out of one piece of wood. Okay. And we have another piece of wood, and then we have a bone barb sitting in there. Okay. And so this is one piece of wood, that's another piece of wood, and this is a bone barb, and this barb sticking up here is what's actually doing the catching. Okay. Now this solves the problem because we if we put a couple holes in here and lash that really well, now when your fish is fighting against this, and same thing here, you're pulling against the lashings. You're not trying to split a, bl a brittle material, you're pulling against the lashings. And the lashings are going to have a very, very high tensile strength and are elastic enough they can resist that. So you're shifting away from just depending on the sheer material thickness of a brittle material to the mechanical advantage of having a lashing in there holding things together and reinforcing it. Now, these are both drastically undersized, right? These halibut hooks are that wide, that long. 
right? They are big hooks. And these Polynesian shark hooks, same size class. I'm giving you the geometry, not the literal size in this little doodle. Another way that is both um, Polynesian and North American, this only occurs in North America in um, Southwest California, so it may be historic Polynesian content, that's a contentious issue, is to make a fish hook like this. And I'm gonna draw the unambiguously Polynesian version. where this is one piece of bone and that's another piece of bone and then we put our lashing in that location so these would be trying to seesaw against each other and the lashing will prevent them from doing that it gives them the ability to move rather than break and the last lashing just says you can't move all the way apart. Mm. Okay. So there's three different concepts on how to make a composite fish hook. You'll also see in North America that much of the halibut hook <laughs> in a lot of areas when you're where people are fishing for much, much smaller fish, right? Where you just have a barb attached to a straight stick. Mm -hmm. And that constitutes the fish hook. Sometimes even two barbs attached to a straight stick, and that constitutes the fish hook, right? Whatever so, works. So <laughs> whatever works, exactly. Yeah, you, you, you take the materials you have, and you figure it out. <laughs> this is how it works, okay? So if you don't have this, you'd come up with something like that, right? If you don't have a piece of bone big enough to make one of these, you can make it out of two pieces of wood or two pieces of bone or wooden bone, right? As long as the bone is the pointy bit or a really hard, tough thorn can also be the pointy bit. Mm. So I want to delve into this idea by making a hook with that design. So I'm going to draw a nicer version of this, cut it out with scissors, and then physically trace that outline on a piece of bone. This lets you use a much smaller piece of bone, right? A bone this size, you wouldn't have to make a two-piece hook. You could just round off this back, right, like that, and have a thick one-piece hook and have plenty of width here to accommodate it. But if you have only a narrow bone or a narrow scrap, you can take this piece and put it behind that piece, and now you only need a piece of bone that's that wide. So this lets you use up your scraps and lets you use smaller bones. If you live in a region of the world that doesn't have, for whatever reason, doesn't have cow bones or a period of time where there weren't cows in that region of the world, um, this lets you use smaller material. So, I'm going to go do a nicer sketch off camera, trace it onto some bone scraps to keep with this concept, and we'll talk about how we are going to cut out some pieces like that. So here I drew some rough outlines on this fragment of bone. Um, you can see on this, this area here is mostly spongy material. Okay, there's very little good stuff in here, spongy almost all the way to the edge. So even though on this side it looks like a big flat face, and if you were just gonna, you know, scrimshaw design on there or something and bold it to a plaque or use it as an inlay or something, you would have all of that. But when I need some thickness, I really only have to about here. So my bone fragment's really only about that much. Okay. Also you can see the this is a natural split, and you can see that this the it's not perfectly linear. That's that idea I've talked to a couple times in these bone carving videos that the grain on bone is something of a spiral and slightly irregular. It doesn't go exactly up and down the bone. It's just something you have to know about it. So again, we're going for this type of hook, 
and I just did a very crude outline in here so that I know where to cut to leave myself with enough material to make both pieces of the hook out of the one piece of bone. Okay, So I'm going to do this in a series of straight cuts just with the simple hacksaw. I'll show you how that idea works. So I'm going to take it back here to my little bench hook carving cradle. And I do like on these harder materials especially to start a groove with the edge of the file because the fine teeth on the file are so much easier to control than a large saw. And we're just going to cut it. Now sitting like this is a somewhat awkward cutting angle. But trying to do this in such a way that you can see it well on that or something. Okay. How far are we from through? We are almost through. I could probably just snap that at this point, but I don't really want to. Because then you really need to go. Yeah, you're going to get a it's nasty, early. nasty fracture. don't like about hacksaws. I didn't do any damage there. I stopped short, but they don't have the nice wide saw plate. There we go. They don't have the nice wide saw plate of woodworking saws. So now there's our first cut. Next, I'm just going to continue taking this apart in pieces. We're going to go for this little cut. This is just all kinds of awkward from a sitting position. And that is about all that I can do with the saw on this one. Now, the rest of this is going to be, I'll grab my coarser file here, just filing it down till I'm close to that line and have the rough out shape. So I'm gonna cut the rest of this and start on this filing project off camera and we'll rejoin when I have made some progress. So we have the two pieces of our fish hook pretty well roughed out at this point. I did a little bit more cutting with the hacksaw, but mostly this was just a function of filing to the final shape. Now, a couple things that are worth mentioning here. When you start to get into really little parts like this, it just gets fiddly to try and hold it and still be able to file on it. So one thing that you can do is take a little piece of leather. This is just a little leather scrap, okay? And wrap your piece in the leather. You can use cloth for this, but leather is definitely, definitely better. Holds up better. Well, it's not that it holds up better. The uh, heavy canvas or denim will hold up just fine. It's that it's a little spongier. Mm. And the reason for that is because I'm going to hold it in a pair of pliers. And the leather is going to prevent the pliers from marring that little piece of bone. And now I will hold the pliers mostly down, but a little bit closed because you can snap this. It is brittle. And now you have an extra hand here. And 
and you can proceed with your filing. Okay. So um, it's definitely a little trick to be on your radar. Have a little scrap of leather there. Um, again, you can use a scrap of denim. You can use a scrap of, of heavy cloth. You can even use a scrap of cardboard if you can't find anything else. But that definitely, now we're back to doesn't hold up. Right, you'll get one or two little squishes and then you're throwing it away. So you're going to have a whole scrap pile of worn out little pieces of cardboard. But if you absolutely don't have anything else, you can use that. Leather is by far the best. So it's just a function of slowly whittling down until you have the shape you want. Okay. Um, at this stage, it's a good time to start in making sure that these meeting surfaces, where we're going to tie these two pieces together, are dead flat. To get started and to get them basically globally flat, the easiest thing to do is to get out a piece of sandpaper okay, and pull it in just one direction across the sandpaper, making sure it's seated and that you're not rocking it. The tendency is to hit and rock as you pull something across sandpaper. Sanding by hand is always going to have a tendency to give you a curved surface. And then you want to see if your surface is indeed curved or not. So you put them together so that they're mating properly and you hold them up to a light source okay, and you see if there's any light shining through. If there is no light shining through, you're good to go. If there's light shining through, then you can go back to the sandpaper or you could note where was it rocking, where were the angles, where were the problem spots, and you could take a little needle file and very pointedly and deliberately take out the high spots. The high spot will almost always be in the middle. Okay, A flat surface can't scoop a hollow but you can roll it across a flat surface. So you will almost always end up with something convex. And you know, then you'll see, oh, I have light here, I have light here. Take a little out with the middle. Okay, And you can file that down and then try it again. And it's just a tedious, fiddly job of put them together and then hold it up to the light and then put them together and hold it up to the light. That's all there is to it. There's no shortcut. You just got to be diligent and keep moving with it. Now, I need to do a little bit on the ends here and get them nice and true. I'll do that off camera. Um, but what I want to do on camera before I go and do those final steps is the next step in this is to round it off. So just like before on the last one, and I'm leaving this jagged edge because it bites in nice. It makes it a little easier to hold. Just like on the previous fish hook in the previous video, we're going to go file it and shape it square. And then take off all the corners to make an octagon. Square octagon round is how you control a rounded shape. Because now I can look and I can look at the line formed by the edge of that facet and make sure it's even. And I can see that it's wide here and tapers off here. So making sure that line is straight is how I can make sure that I'm maintaining my cross section all the way around and maintaining it evenly. And then once you have those lines, then you come back and you can just turn it and take all the corners off. Okay, So I'm going to work on getting this to an octagon and getting these ends squared off. And then we'll come back and do the final steps on it. We have made considerable progress in our little fish hook project here. Um, it's all rounded off nice. We have a nice little barb, and that's a reasonable size for a utilitarian barb. 
there are historic examples of bone hooks with gigantic barbs. But a lot of the photos that you'll see if you go trolling around the internet instead of looking at archaeological papers and museum pages, a lot of the bone hooks you'll see have real exaggerated gigantic barbs for aesthetic impact. Okay, uh, But this is made as a practical fishing hook, not just a decorative one. Um, it's sanded mostly smooth. If this was going to be purely utilitarian, it's done in terms of surface finish. If you wanted to continue and make something more ornamental out of it, it could use a little bit of 400 and 500 grit sandpaper. But that's a choice, right? There, there's not a wrong answer to that. I will do a little bit more sanding on this before it's all said and done, but that's not absolutely necessary. Now what we do need to do is we need to look at the base and how we're going to lash these together and we need to look at the end where we attach the line. Now in a straight taper hook like this there are two common things that you'll see in terms of historic hooks and how you attach a line to them. They all fall in the category of taking a line or a loop putting it against the shank and then wrapping it down with thread or some sort of snood lashing. Okay. Um, they are either to leave a knob on the end, which is more common in North American examples, or to cut a series of grooves in it, which is more common in oceanic examples. Now, note how I phrase that. If, it is po if, if you do something to the end of this hook that makes it possible to attach a line to it, it has a precedent everywhere, right? So there is a great deal of convergent evolution in these sorts of things. Because sticks are sticks and rope is rope and fish is fish and physics is physics no matter where you go. If it works, somebody done it, right? It's, it's just the reality of looking at a lot of these types of technologies. So. I'm going to start in here and file some groups. We'll deal with this first. And this is just a very simple process of taking a file and very carefully cutting in a groove, making sure that you don't migrate and turn your nice groove into a spiral. We want a groove, we don't want a spiral in this instance. So I'm going lightly around to make sure that my cuts are oriented properly. Okay. And then once I have that established, I can set the file in, feel right where I have that. and then continue around. Okay. And there's our first groove. Now, this doesn't have to be a super deep groove. It just has to be a little catch that will help prevent the lashing from sliding off the end and releasing the fish hook into the fish you have just caught. Okay? So, I will continue the rest of those off camera. The next thing we need to look at is the base of this hook. Okay? So this is going to get lashed together with some twine. Now again, this is just completely smooth and won't give a good surface to lash the twine around. So I'm going to take a narrower file and I'm going to start very much the same way, okay, by just cutting down in, cutting a groove there, okay. 
Now these are fairly small cuts. They might be a little bit difficult to see in the film. So I'll hold it here against the black surface, right? And then, what's the width? That's a little too wide. Stick with the triangular file. And now I can set it in that groove and kind of roll it over. And then I'm just going to round that back off. And this is going to be under a lashing, just examining it here a little bit more closely. This is going to be under a lashing, so it doesn't have to be quite as perfect and pretty as the surfaces that are going to show. But we do want a nice, even curve to it. Okay. So now if I put this like that, there's the after, and there's the before. Okay? You can see that groove that we cut in it. Now, there's a little bit of a step there I want to take off, so I'm just going to use the tip of this half round, just smooth that off. Anytime you have a brittle material, you really don't want 90 degree corners in it. Doesn't matter if we're talking about bone or steel or stone. Ninety degree corners are just the devil because they act as stress concentration points and make it more likely to snap. Okay, and now here's where the little bit of kind of fiddly stuff starts is in smoothing that off I get made that a little concave relative to here. So I'm just going to go back to this triangular file even it a little bit. Maybe the tip of that will work better. Just want to take out that concavity without producing a new 90 degree step. Okay? And I've got a little bit more work to do there, but very little. And you can see that nice spot which will allow the thread to seat and hold it firmly. Okay, So, I'm going to do a couple more grooves around the tip of this and I'm going to cut a indentation in the barb piece to match this and then we'll tie them together and have a finished project. So, we are all done with the carving on this. I put three grooves in here in order to provide that attachment point. Now I mentioned that bone hooks in general that have a tapered shank out to the tip often have a knob. That would look similar to what I did down here where you just have a knob at the end to prevent the threads from falling off after you tie these things together. And tie them together is the very last step that we need to do. So for this we need some thin twine. Now this is the thinnest twine that I was able to get my hands on. And it's just some commercial jute. Now I wish it was thinner. 
the thinner it is, the better that it's able to hold the hook. But I was trying to untwist this and get each of the two yarns, this is two ply, get each of the two yarns by itself and just didn't have the strength. So it does need to be a at least two ply twisted material, but the absolute finest you can find. Any natural material um, is legitimate. You could use a synthetic material. We do live in the modern world. But the finer the better and to a point, right? Obviously to a point. You need the tensile strength. Um, this will work, but you definitely would not want to use anything thicker. Now, I haven't found good literature on traditional ways of doing this particular lashing. So I did the best I could from viewing some, you know, trolling the internet for museum pages, photographs, things like that. The problem is that this type of hook, usually you find that and not much else archaeologically, right? Um, because the barb is an expendable part, right? If this breaks, you lose the barb, but you keep the main thing. So you only lose a third of your, you know, a third of your work, which is an advantage. But usually you go and you look at um, collections of these things and you find that, or you find that, you hardly ever find the two together lashed together, right? Um, and museums that do have these from more modern collections, anthropological collections, are not in the business of untying them to see how they are tied. And I do not have access to an elder or somebody who is experienced in making these. So I'm trying to interpret the design as best as I am able. If you are watching this and you have particular knowledge on how to improve the lashing that I'm about to do, please share it in the comments. I would love to hear from you. But what we're going to do is we're going to start our lashing from the bend side. And this is very, very fiddly. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to extend the back of the rope like that. And I'm going to wrap it back over itself like this. Okay. Now my fingers are going to be in the way. And it's just such a small area to hold on to. It's tricky. But I'm going to start it like that, cross over, wrap it back. This is the same way you tie line onto a hook when you're tying a fly. I get all the way to the back, straighten it out, and then I'm going to come forward. And then we're going to do some figure eights around the shank to hold it in place. So that's the strategy. Now this is a very, very fiddly process. So there's the first two wraps. Now you can see it's wanting to pull sideways a little bit. So I have two wraps on. Now that'll kind of hold itself together enough that I can poke things around and adjust them. Get those ropes where I want them, get the pieces where I want them. You can also pull on the tag end to tighten it there. Check it again, it did shift on me a little bit. Take your time with this. Don't Put another hasty. wrap on. Don't be hasty. Okay. After every wrap, just adjusting, trying to keep out of the parts where I want them. There's a nice, neat, secure first round of wraps. But if I point this at you without losing it, you can see 
there's quite a lot of play in that. Okay. So to take that play out, we have to get our yarn back up. here. And this bulkiness is why I wish I had a thinner rope. Okay. And now from here we're going to do some figure eight wraps, but I need a way to fix the thread when I'm all finished. So I'm taking another loop another piece and I'm pointing the loop toward the end of the hook. Okay. So I'm all the way to the crotch there. And now I'm going to do a figure eight crossover come down the bar point. And every one of these, take a minute and adjust it. So you're going to want to crawl on you. Okay. I'm going to do three of these. And then one more around the end. Now from there, shorten that a little bit. You can see this has taken most of the play out of that tip. From here, I'm going to use this loop to pull it through and underneath and, and fix it in. So I'm going to take the end and pull it through. Don't pull it all the way tight. If you pull this all the way tight like that, it's a real bugger to try and pull through because it wants to bind up. So leave a little slack in it, and then grab those two ends and just give that a mighty yoink. Okay? That's a technical term, a mighty yoink. So sounds like a good band name. Could be. <laughs> Could be. I don't know what kind of music they would play, but I, I can't argue with that. Okay? And then we're going to pull all of these tight. Okay? And there we have our finished hook. Now, um, I, like I said, I would love to have some twine that was a little bit finer than this because it would be a slightly less bulky attachment. But, then on the other hand, this is about the thickness that you see illustrated in surviving bone hooks from anthropological collections. So, you know, take what you want. Do you want to be maximally artistic and try to find the best of the best of modern materials? And, you know, you could easily get some, uh, what's it not in frame, hun? There we go. Good. Okay. You could easily get some very, very high quality nylon threads or artificial sinew. Do not use natural sinew for this. Not a good, not a good game. Okay. But you could use artificial sinew, which is just thick nylon thread, something like that. And you could get a real nice, tidy tie-off connection here. And it would look really great. Um, you can absolutely do that. But this is, you know, in keeping with what you see on traditional hooks that are lashed up this way from anthropological collections. So there we have our hook. So that's the second hook in the series. There's the first. The Not in the frame? Ah, there we go. Is that in? Yes. Okay, awesome.
So this was the first one that we made from the one piece of the cow bone. This is the second one from the two pieces. The third one is going to be carved from a big honking bone and it's going to be more of an ornamental model. So if you're enjoying this video series, I hope that you'll give it a thumbs up so that the YouTube algorithm knows that you're enjoying it and shows it to others. And I will see you next time here for another carving project.